But here's something that many of us have not taken a thought about. That Ethiopia is the second most populous country in Africa with over 90 million people, out of which 90% have no broadband internet access. The case of Ethiopia is the same with the 45 least developed countries in the world. 90% without affordable broadband internet access. 90%. We do three things at the Web Foundation. The first thing we do is access. We work for access to the internet for everyone. The second thing we do is voices, the web we want, working for the open and the free web. And the third thing we do is opening up information, open data for social justice. So basically, um, I'm an activist for human development, working in an organization that wants to use the web to achieve just that. That's why when you see me, I always say, my name is Nenna, and I come from the internet. So what the, the birth and the growth of the internet has actually done in one way is to widen social divides that we are already there. Divides between men and women, divides between older and younger generations, divides between rural and urban dwellers, divides between those who can afford, who, who are paid, who are financially well off, and those who don't have. So these are all the divides that still exist and are now being imported into the digital world. When we talk about digital divide, it is the haves and the haves not of digital opportunities of connectivity access. Today, being connected is not enough, um, just a little internet, um, because we are living in a hyper-connected environment. You need to speak, you need to video, you need audio, you need to upload, you need to download, you need to connect, you need to reconnect, you need to file a lot of things, you need to work interactively online. You need the minimum broadband access to do all of this. So if you have a 512K and, and you connect him with someone who, who is cruising in the gigabytes, you are almost as dead as nothing because the person is, is putting down, dumping videos on you and you can't even reply, you can't even pull the videos. So um, there is a divide between those who connected and those who are not connected. And within those who are connected, there is those we call broadband poor and broadband rich. Half your information and your activities and your interactions are shifting to online, you know. And if you don't have access, then it means you're missing out. Most of the information that the government and the corporates and the daily life uh, information is coming online. So if I don't have access to online, I'm missing out that entire information and therefore the opportunity and therefore my rights and therefore my, you know, empowerment. So it's very, very integrated. I would say uh, infrastructure is the biggest barrier and we must know that India, even though one of the highest, most connected country in the world, <clears throat> is still more than 80% of the country is not connected. Even in the mobile connectivity or mobile usage, more than 60% of the country is not connected and more than 72% of the women not connected. So there is a whole, whole, whole lot of disconnected or unconnected population in the country. When you come to Africa, um, there are more females put in more hours on working than men. But in, in terms of revenue, it's in the hands of men. So we have a gender battle to fight. And what happens 
is that if there is only one computer in a home, you can be sure that it's in the hand of the man. So these are traditional taboos uh, that have always been there. And the, the main folk who do not understand that everybody deserves an opportunity are still riding on that. And what we see um, from our own studies is that those who have had access to education, to development, are the same ones who have access to connectivity. And those who've not had access to education, to development, to social amenities, are still the same ones not having access to broadband. We think we are all connected to the internet. We believe we can send at any time, anywhere, any message. We can look up any information, anytime, anywhere. We are glued to our screens. Our analog lives are becoming increasingly mixed with our cyberspace. But who is we? Of the 7 billion people, 4 billion do not have access to the internet at all. 2 billion have only limited access to the internet. Only 1 billion people have major access to the internet. We are not the world. We are on the have side of the digital divide. What happens in Africa is that 50 to 70 percent of Africans live in rural areas. Which means that for you to take internet connectivity to their homes, to the last miles, you have to do an extra investment. And if you're taxing them, federal taxation, state taxation, right of way, youth tax, all kinds of taxation. So what happens is that the company will pay, and of course it will impute the cost to the, the, the final user. So that is taxation. Taxation is driving the fear of investment. It is driving users away from buying new, new devices, and it is not helping us as much. And the more knowledge you create, the better you are. And why are we fighting? Because connectivity allows innovation. And both are linked together. So give anyone connectivity, you are empowering them for innovation. Give them connectivity, you are empowering them for better education. Give them connectivity, you are empowering them for gender equality. Give them connectivity, you are empowering them for social cultural development. The internet was made so there should be free movement of packets. The, the things that, that the people who run around the internet are not human beings, they are, sec they are packets. So the free movement of packets from one end to another should remain. Um, my boss is Tim Berners-Lee. When, he, when these people walked over the internet and the web to set out the protocols, they did not for once think that there should be differential treatment. They did not for once put it down that no, some people's traffic should be slower and some others faster because of who they are, because of how much they have. No. So that freedom on the internet, freedom of individuals, freedom of association, freedom of rights, and freedom of packages. That is the way I describe net neutrality. Freedom of technology, freedom of um, traffic must remain. Freedom is the biggest word in the web. It's like going to a, a place where there's a drought and saying today I'm giving each person a, a, a glass of water. Water is something that you need three liters minimum every day to drink. So giving someone half a glass of water does not really solve the problem. If you want to give someone water they need for a day, it's minimum three liters per person, excluding their bath. So if you want to give me internet, bring it on. But please do not give me the one that frustrates me. And what happens is that when you begin to migrate your services, your, your applications, your work, over to the digital world, and then you do not have the internet connectivity to follow through, then you are, you are, it becomes more catastrophic.
but they haven't been able to find the same kind of things for the internet. Some people would like us to believe that all these zero rating applications, so where you, for example, get access to Facebook very cheaply, are the future and that this is really going to make a, a difference. But I think if we go that, down that route, if this is where we um, like put our future, we will create two classes of citizens on the internet. You have the people who access the whole of the internet and you have the people who access those gated communities. And all of us, I think, believe that what the value of the internet lies in that enormous richness of things you can do with it, not just in Facebook or in Twitter, which we might find them valuable, fun, um, but it doesn't give you access to all the information that you need. So then basically we are saying that for poor people this is good enough? I don't think so. The solutions are not so easy. I mean, India has a rich culture of cyber cafes as well. They're still quite popular, although their number has started to shrink. Um, you also see that, for example, films, etc., are often downloaded by uh, like mini entrepreneurs, say, and then uh, young men just go to those places and say, oh, can you load this on a pen drive or whatever, and then people load it onto their phones like that, so they don't actually spend the data themselves. But if you look at the end of the chain, there is somebody who had internet access and did that. So you also have those creative thinking solutions like that. So this is where the, the power of big companies comes in, right? If we now say that a little internet is better than nothing at all, those people are never going to get the internet. They will get that and nothing else. Because this is the, the incentives to find solutions to make sure that people get access to the whole of the internet disappear. The telecom companies, uh, the big intermediaries, they'll all make money through that model of giving people a little internet. And they don't have a stake in making sure that changes then. We have to remember all the time, I think, that even if the services they provide us with are valuable in our lives, they are businesses and their responsibility is not to us but to their shareholders and their goal is not enlightenment of people, but making profits. I actually thought we had the web we wanted. The way the web started, it started free. It's free architecture, freedom to engage, freedom to be part of it. Nobody ever needed to write a letter to belong to the web. So all web citizens, we are born free. Problem started when we had a, uh, interest, financial interest, taking away that liberty, saying we want to cut off some part of the web and keep it to ourselves. So we are not freedom fighters of the web. We are web citizens who are fighting to, re to retain the essence of what the web is.